and break the banks with M. Higgins. We're live right now on YouTube, Twitter, also WOR Radio on Spotify, wherever you can hear the sound of my voice. I'm Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, and we're being joined by a serial entrepreneur who's owner of a billion-dollar portfolio of beloved consumer brands such as Magnolia Bakery. He's the co-founder of RSC Ventures with Gary V and author of the book, Burn the Boat, which is in his background on the live YouTube. So folks, uh, follow me on YouTube also, uh, The Financial Quarterback, just search for me. So Matt, for those who don't know you as a Harvard business lecturer and all around good guy, describe your background and uh, why people should care about your book. Good question. Uh, so grew up in Queens, Queens native. Shout out to anyone there from Queens. Uh, grew up uh, uh, under pretty dire circumstances. High school dropout at 16 after selling flowers on street corners and scraping gum at McDonald's. Uh, dropped out intentionally, which is the genesis of the title of the book. Uh, dropped out after realizing that uh, there's got to be another way uh, to escape poverty and um, failed three years in a row, two years in a row. And then uh, came up with a hack, which was to take my GED, do well enough to go to college at 16. That was my first burn the boats move, literally sabotaged my education. And by doing that, went from making, you know, 375 at an hour at McDonald's or five bucks at a deli to, uh, you know, making $8 an hour. It was basically my first way to, you know, advance myself economically to get out of poverty. And, and then uh, within uh, a few years, I was the youngest press secretary in history, managing the response to 9-11. So... The book is all about how do you how do you put yourself in a position where you have no alternative and to win. And it's borrowed from military history. People listening right now will remember the phrase burn the boats from Alexander the Great and Sun Tzu Art of War. And the purpose of the book is to pull forward that military doctrine, apply it to peacetime and to prove to people that the way you achieve outlandish, incredible breakthrough success is by giving yourself no other alternative. So if you're just joining us on Twitter Spaces, also YouTube, I'm Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback, host a radio show on WOR, New York's, radio sh- uh, New York's uh, AM Talker, every Saturday and Sunday at 9, also on Spotify. We're talking talking to Matt Higgins, burn the boats, break the banks. So let's talk about who were your press secretary for? I was press secretary for a guy named Rudy Giuliani. Uh, that was a different version than the one you may have known if you were born in this uh, decade. But back then, uh, you know, he was America's mayor on 9-11 and the right person for the right time. So I was by his side uh, during the response to the crisis. And obviously it's a shame on how it, uh, it's playing out. But back then, he did a phenomenal job running the city of New York and handling the crisis. Wow. And did were you involved in his presidential campaign or not really? Had you moved on by then? No, not at all. Uh, back then, I was supporting John McCain. I was a big, huge McCain fan, so I, I was pretty, pretty heavily involved in the McCain campaign and the Mitt Romney campaign back in the day. And then I uh, left the Republican Party uh, at the advent of uh, Donald Trump. I, I, one thing you may not realize: I worked on the McCain primary uh, in South Carolina. I, I went down to South Carolina to work the McCain primary, the McCain Bush primary. Did you have anything to do with that? That was a wild primary, the South yeah, Carolina I, primary. I was uh, I was working with um, Woody Johnson at the New York Jets back at the time, and he was finance chair. I think we were for the convention, and I just got to know uh, Mike Murphy and all the guys around McCain. I just love John McCain, true American hero, Maverick, as I mean, actually known as Maverick, but but uh, you know, war hero and, and just a man of principle and conviction. So. I was I was very 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 motivated to work on that. And you remember his concession speech when he lost to Barack Obama? It couldn't have been classier. Yeah, we. I don't know. If, yeah, my one of my best friend's father uh, passed away, and McCain during the presidential election actually took time out of it to go uh, console a young widow, and he was a member of the uh, South Carolina government. And I. I Got some respect for him, got to meet him, and uh, it was a nice time to meet him. So that's a crazy world, small world. So we got small, Rudy Giuliani, John McCain. Uh, you're a disaffected, I guess, former Republican. But um, we're not really going to talk about politics. There. We're going to talk about finance, all these other things. But I just like to know people's background. So you mentioned you had um, – you failed twice 
before your GED? What, what was that about? Why'd you feel? Yeah, so when I was, so take everybody back in time a bit. This is a pretty radical decision, right? So it was born by desperation, admittedly. My mother had all sorts of uh, ish health issues that were compounding over time. And, uh, and I'm a little kid, right? When you're being raised by a single mother, uh, you're hoping for all sorts of saviors. You know, I was hoping a man would step into our lives and fix things and the government would step in and fix things and didn't have health care, would go to food pantries, relied a lot on the Catholic church, knocking on the door on holidays. So just sort of this general sense of why is there no cavalry coming? And then eventually capitulation saying, okay, I have to take matters into my own hands. I see how this is going to end. And I spent a lot of years as a kid hiding uh, our conditions, living in shame. And so uh, when I was, you know, I don't remember the exact age, 13, 14, I had a pit, an epiphany born by my mother. She had went, she was a high school dropout uh, through dire circumstances herself, but she was always embarrassed and she was very smart, fiercely intelligent. And I watched her get a GED at Queensborough Community College and enter college. And it was the first time I saw her happy but I also witnessed the, you know, the, the mobility, right? And uh, that's what was the inspiration. I started doing research saying, wait a minute, if she's able to do that, you know, inadvertently, what if I were to do it on purpose? And I started going to, high, you know, college planning sessions at the high school, asking, you know, admissions counselors, like theoretically, if one were to drop out of high school and do well enough on the GD, would you admit them? And, you know, everybody loves a hard luck story. Like, sure, young man, suppose it's possible. Anything's possible in America. And that was me getting this excitement of like, wait a second, when juxtaposed against this desperate circumstance, uh, it just makes economic sense to bypass high school. I don't think algebra is that important, but getting this little piece of paper could really unlock so much potential. So of course I tell my guidance counselor like, no, no, when I'm getting picked up by the truant police at McDonald's, I have a plan. And everyone said, you're absolutely crazy. And I realized it, it was, there were so many attempts at intervention. It was just really annoying me. And that was my second burn the boats epiphany is like sometimes when you're doing something, when the whole weight of the world is against you, you need to actually sabotage your retreat because I knew eventually I would also just cave. Right. And I try and I thought I need to make myself such a write off that I don't even have an option and they certainly don't care anymore. And that's when I decided to fail everything except for typing. I thought that would be useful. And uh, and I would just get left back over and over. And finally, the school was more focused on getting me off their statistics and transferring me to a place called Auxiliary High School Services. I forgot the euphemism, but they technically then wouldn't have to register you as a dropout and everybody got out of my way. So, you know, again, a little bit of this is maybe hindsight bias in, in writing the book, but, but not truly because I've replicated this idea again and again, saying if I put myself in dire circumstances where I don't really have all the answers, but I give myself no retreat, the, my capacity to just figure it out is way deeper than I realize until my backup is against the wall. So I decided to channel all that into a, hopefully the definitive manifesto on what does it take for all of us to fully commit to our, to our you know, bold dreams. Wonderful. We're on Twitter spaces at your financial QB. If you have a question, you can come up, ask a uh, billion dollar portfolio owner, Matt Higgins, of Magnolia Bakery and others. I want to talk about that. Well, and it was a billion dollars until the last week. You know, it's it probably was. declining <laughs> as we speak. That is everything else. So there you go. But yeah. uh, so what I want to kind of go through your, so you grew up, that's kind of interesting because your your story with, with the whole McCain thing and, and the political interest, interest in money and having kind of a poverty kind of in shame background, I have the same thing. My, my mm. father got disabled when I was 12, and we were in a normal kind of probably a, a, a lower middle class neighborhood, but we were like destitute for a period of time living on the generosity of the church. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I was kind of drawn to politics for a while thinking, OK, I could help people. Then after a while, I'm like, nobody's going to help you. So you just got to build a business. <laughs> And, and help other people. You know, we, we basically went to the same school, right? Yeah. right? I mean, that is, by the way, that was what it was drawn to politics too. I always felt this sense that I could, you know, naively little boy, you know, fight for justice, John F. Kennedy, John uh, Kennedy, you know, uh, profiles and courage. That was sort of my inspiration. But that was my genesis was this sort of savior complex, right? That if I had power, you know, I could change things when I was a kid. Yeah, and then for some reason I learned that politics wouldn't be good for me and Mike. 
I was 22, 21, 23, got my master's degree early, and I, I worked and was newly married, and we were just struggling, and then I was recruited by a Wall Street headhunter, and the rest is history. Uh, but it was yeah, the, I went a little, I went a little further down the road, right? I, I, uh, I actually, because everyone's like, how do you, how do you have all these hopscotches to different industries, right? And it's just, they so they seem somewhat disconnected, and they're actually very connected. And the connective tissue is that whatever job I've ever had since I was that little kid scraping gum at McDonald's, uh, I, I realized if you make yourself indispensable, whatever job you're doing, those who control capital and labor will give you a bigger problem. A job is just a problem being solved, right, that, uh, that you're being paid for. And so I realized that early on when I was at McDonald's and scraping gum under the tables and, and that eventually got promoted when I was a little kid to running the party room. I was like, oh, this is how it works. Now I get the clean chicken McNugget fragments, you know, from the corners, but it's a step up. And one after another after another I was writing a little column for a weekly newspaper, a little muckraker when I was, you know, 18, 19. I was a good communicator. Uh, and then I ended up at the mayor's office, you know, basically taking newspaper clippings and distributing them. But they were having me ghostwrite uh, uh, speeches for the mayor. And this is a mistake young people make, I do think. It's like when, when you when you when you, when someone gives you an opportunity, compensation always lags, right? Uh, opportunity is always a leading indicator of future prosperity, but compensation is a lagging indicator. But we get frustrated too soon, or we get entitled too soon. And I always looked at it the different way. There's lots of ways to use leverage that comes from when you're solving a problem for somebody else. One way is compensation, but that that to me is less significant than advancement. And so I would always use the leverage that was created by me when willing to literally do anything at any time with my skills to eventually use that leverage to advance. And so first time I did that was at the mayor's office. I, after doing speech writing for a while, I was like, well, I want to be deputy press secretary. And they're like, but well, you're like 12 years old. I'm like, no, I'm 22, but I want to be deputy press secretary and oversee the police and fire department. And uh, the answer was like, wait your turn. And I was like, well, I have a better idea. I'm going to quit. And then four months later, they brought me back as deputy press secretary. So my formula has always been leveraging whatever it is I've done, making myself indispensable, and using that little bit of power and influence to get me to the next step. And I've done that until by the time I was 26 years old, I became the youngest press secretary. So I went from McDonald's and selling flowers on street corners at 14, 15, 16, to by the time I was 26, press secretary. The downside, and why I wrote about this openly in the book, is this isn't a fairy tale. It's real life. And so the day I become press secretary, I'm living in squalor. My mother can't even get out of the chair. She's pleaded with me not to go to work that morning. And I said, we have nothing in the bank. We're, we're a house of cards. And no one's ever even been in this place before this house. And then she died that morning uh, at 11 o'clock in the morning. Mm. So, you know, you and I sounds like we learned a lot of the hard lessons, right? You have to be an agent in your own rescue. There are no guaranteed happy endings. But the connective tissue of my life has been this burn the boats mentality coupled with this making myself indispensable, whatever it is. And no job is beneath me. Mm. Yeah, that's a great tip. No job is beneath you. And when we return, we'll talk about from Wall Street to the White House. Everyday Americans are being told that the economy is headed for a soft landing and to keep spending as usual. What are your thoughts on that? When we return, this is Josh Jelinski. The financial quarterback, don't touch that dial. And we're back. This is Josh Jelinski, the financial quarterback with Matt Higgins, who we have a lot in common. I mean, everything, even like, but I picked the wrong guy. So my Rudy Giuliani was, although he's a great guy, Mayor Brett Schumler of Jersey City. He changed Jersey City around. I thought he was going to be like the next JFK, and he's very inspirational. Um, funny, funny story, I... Going in the 2005 campaign, and I go, Brett's going to lose to to the mayor of Bogota. And they were like, the mayor of Bogota? Who's he? He was the guy talking about the – because I did enough analysis. Now, mind you, I was 21. So, you know, like people – they they love you for the cheap labor in campaigns. But I was like, Brett's going to lose the 05 primary by 5%. Doug Forrester's going to win. And you got to take down and challenge the petitions of Steve Lonigan. He was the mayor of Bogota. Turns out the four or five percent that Lonigan won caused Brett to lose, and then Chris Christie nominate him for sec- uh, secretary of education or something, and hug him out to dry on something. But he he was a great 
uh, mayor of Jersey City. Got Goldman to invest there. All those businesses came. Uh, really yeah, was, look, at Jersey, look at Jersey City now. I mean, it's incredible. Right? And it started with uh, Brett Schilder. So I thought he'd be a great uh, governor and uh, we, brilliant guy. But anyway, enough about that. But but that was my yeah, last I mean, I, I, yeah, campaign. I, 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 my, my passion, I mean, again, it's interesting about Giuliani is like it, I feel very loyal to the man who gave me that opportunity and would always look past age, and I will always remain loyal to that incarnation. But I, I said I never signed like an oath of fealty to support all the other crazy stuff that follows. So, you know, that's sort of – I'm of two views. Like it's mostly sort of mourning, to be honest, what, what once was. But anyway, is what it is. Mitt Romney is somebody that I actually kind of became my relative version of, you know, JFK. Uh, that I got to know him very well. Always admired that man. Wow. So, yeah, we'll get your political lessons, your business lessons. So how do you go, okay, struggling to politics to business? What brought you into the business world, and what was your first, like, burn the boats uh, moment, I guess, from politics to business? Like, how how do you make that <laughs> that's a, transition? That's a great so, so uh, great question. So post 9-11, there was a newly, aged, uh, newly created federally funded agency to rebuild the World Trade Center called the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation. It was a joint state city entity. And anyone who knows New York politics knows that the mayor of New York and the governor of New York never get along with each other. But I happened to straddle, straddle that space in between. Uh, and they appointed me one of the first employees, maybe like the second. I mean, literally a cell phone couple billion dollars, no man, no template. John Whitehead was the chairman. And so I was on the ground from the moment the second plane hit the tower within, you know, within an hour and all, for two years uh, helping set up the uh, largest design competition in history, helped figure out the Freedom Tower, the Memorial Complex. And so I did that for two years. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of trauma to be carrying, like, incessantly and felt like I had, I had done what I set out to do. And I wanted to transition to business, and I ended up transitioning to the New York Jets. And how did I go from politics to football, sports? It's uh, I always zoom out on what I'm doing, so I never narrowly define who I am or put myself in a box. I could have defined myself as a government employee, but that was not my destiny. As a press person, that was not my destiny. But I, instead, I was somebody who could um, bring together or navigate complicated public-private processes. And the Jets at the time needed to build a stadium of their own. And so that's how I started yeah, uh, in, uh, in sports. And I, I rose up and, you know, over the course of eight years, ended up running the business of the team. But m my DNA is not to run a mature institution. It doesn't resonate with me over time. And we had done a great job re you know, restoring the Jets financially and otherwise building the stadium. But what I really wanted to do was be in a perpetual state of building, be an entrepreneur. And so my burn the boats moment was to give up the trappings of that office on the 50-yard line and the heady job of, you know, being an EVP of the New York Jets and start from scratch. Uh, I wanted to create businesses and back entrepreneurs, and I partnered with um, Stephen Ross, who is the one most prominent developer in the United States and a serial entrepreneur and owner of the Dolphins. And so we, we, we basically struck a deal that I would oversee the business of the team, transform it, but that I would build companies and back rate entrepreneurs. And that's what set this entire, you know, crazy chapter of my career in motion. Yeah, wow. We're with Matt Higgins, author of the book, Burn the Boats. So, yeah, so uh, what's it like working for Mr. Ross? Uh, it's been amazing because uh, we just always see eye to eye on disruption. He never feels enslaved to conventional wisdom. He's always looking at things the wrong way. You know, it's great to have somebody in your life. You, like you think you're on the bleeding edge, and then you have somebody you work alongside of like, Wow, you're really on the boat. You're really a risk taker. You really look at things differently. So I'll give the Gary Vaynerchuk story is a great example. For those who know Gary Vaynerchuk, which is pretty much almost everybody, uh, I met Gary Vayner Vaynerchuk in 2009. Uh, I was supposed to sell him a suite. My team was like, this guy says he's going to buy the Jets. Let's go sell him a suite. I was like, he's not buying a suite, but if you wish. And I went to a bagel store in New Jersey. I've told this story before. And I, and I met with Gary and listened to him you know, go on and on about – what social media is going to be and just like paint this picture of the universe. And it all kind of made sense. You know, you have to look past the, the bombastic veneer and the cursing and then realize like, wow, he said a lot of things that day, including every single person is going to be a combination of Comcast, you know, uh, HBO, 
and the Sopranos, right? Like, they're going to be able to create the TV show, distribute the TV show, and go directly to the consumer. This is 2009. It all made sense. And he's like, me and my little brother, AJ, when he's out of college, we're going to create a firm to go after it, to help these big, stodgy companies navigate social media. And I gave him four Jets tickets to become the first client. And when I partnered up with Ross, I was like, you know, social media is going to upend everything. So to be a partner in this firm, we would have this incredible asset at our back, no matter what we did. This was many, many years ago. Fast forward, we're now partners in what is the largest privately owned ad agency in the United States. We just finished three Super Bowl ads at the Super Bowl. So Ross, when I you know, painted this picture, it was like you know, 30 seconds. I get it, I get it, I get it. Go do it, get it done. You know, so that, that's what it's like partnering with Steve. They're, they're always willing to look at the world from a different angle. And even though he's you know, 80, 83, like, he's got more energy and more creativity than a, than a 22-year-old. Now talk about RSC Ventures. What what yeah. what, what is that? So, you 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 sold Gary V on Jets yeah. tickets. How do you go from selling him to now your partners with him? Well, we ended up we acquired a significant stake in the firm, and uh, and that's just generally been the way. It's either we've incubated companies from scratch, we created the leading communications firm that does direct to consumer businesses. And we built that from scratch. We partnered with Gary to build Resi. Those uh, out there may know the restaurant reservation system, which we sold to Amex. So it's been a lot of, you know, incubations from scratch and then investing sizable stakes and in, in other great consumer brands. So ones people might know listening are uh, David Chang, Momofuku. Uh, I've been David's partner for years now. Milk Bar. I acquired Magnolia Bakery in the pandemic. Uh, lots of huge uh, portfolio of direct-to-consumer businesses, about 100 of them. Great brands people would know. Uh, and then took all that expertise and brought it to Harvard Business School, where I teach uh, the leading course with my co-professors on direct-to-consumer businesses. So fast forward, over the last decade, we've built a pretty tremendous portfolio of these great consumer brands. And back to Steve, what makes him amazing is what does this kid from Queens who started with a GD and came from politics know about investing? And he gave me a ton of latitude to build this incredible, incredible portfolio. Wow, that's fun. Yeah, a lot, yeah, of, a lot been, of cool similarities. Yeah, so what um, So what would the, be some of the brands that our listeners know? Uh, I, again, I think, well, let's talk about soccer, right? So this gives you a sense of how we operate. Uh, Steve and I saw an, an opportunity in around 2015 that soccer was going to become huge in this country. Everyone's always predicting it, but we had a match in Miami uh, at the at, uh, Dallas Sun Life Stadium where uh, it was the middle of the week. I think it was Barcelona, Shivas. I'm forgetting exactly, but the stadium was sold out. This was at a time when Dolphins weren't selling out. And it was a sense, this is something. This could be something great. And we decided, let's build a tournament in the United States to build the best team, bring the best teams here, which we did. And so when you see Barcelona and Real Madrid and those that come on through, that's us putting these matches on. So we worked tirelessly to sort of build this uh, business, to, to earn the trust of, these teams, which are, you know, relatively speaking, globally, like the New York Yankees to the 10th power, right, in terms of following. So it takes a lot to earn their respect. And then we just put the work in endless trips to Madrid and Switzerland and understanding Europe. And now fast forward, uh, everyone listening probably has heard of the Champions League. Uh, we are partners with UEFA, which is the body, governing body of football in Europe. And we sell their media rights in the United States. We are partners with La Liga now, in the, and we sell their media rights in the United States. So you can imagine how hard it is for a couple of Americans to break through that tradition and prove ourselves with hard work, but that's kind of our DNA. So we tend to take on really hard things, lots of times build it from scratch uh, or turn things around and, uh, and just put in the work. So, again, that's something people would know. Bluestone Lane, big coffee company from Australia, uh, that we have a significant position in that. People might know that, too. Well, I yeah, I I was looking over the Magic Spoon is big. I know Magic Spoon. Yeah, I was the uh, I was wrote one of the first checks into that uh, Magic I, Spoon. I think uh, that's a genius book. idea. And Isn't it great? I talk about that in my book. Burn the boats is a great case study because the kids who created that uh, were you know what their previous business was? Cricket yeah. protein. They were wow. cricket protein, and I I use that as a as oh, an they illustration. Were the cricket of protein guys in Shark Tank, same guys or different people? Yeah, Is... they're different people, but same folly. <laughs> you know, they were like, we're gonna bring cricket protein to the masses, and I used it as an illustration of a few points. One, that success is ultimately determined by the pivots you make, 
and the value you extract from the thing that you were doing that wasn't working, right? So they were in cricket protein. They could have continued doing that in perpetuity, which would have ended up as a big fat zero, right? But they, they one, they made the pivot to a bigger category, which was cereal. But two, they took all the learnings that they learned from trying to take a, a complicated protein and put it in a, in, a, in a form factor that would resonate. So, you know, cricket protein wasn't it. But then they had this epiphany of like, no one's reinvented the cereal aisle at all. Anything that's good for you with the cereal aisle is being force fed you like Metamucil. You know, it's got this antiseptic look. It's not very oh, appealing. Yeah. Like, what if we took the Lucky Charms aesthetic that you're used to as a kid, but reimagined it with protein, you know, keto forward, right, perception? And it seems obvious now to you and I because we love it. And lots of people here listening love Magic Spoon. But at the moment, it wasn't. And so I use them to illustrate what happens when you have this proprietary insight that is truly leading edge. The magnitude of an opportunity has an inverse relationship to the amount of data and support you're going to get for it. So what I mean is like, if it's really a big idea, like Magic Spoon was, a lot of people aren't going to see it and you're not going to find any evidence to support it because it's that big of an idea. And you need to get yourself comfortable with moving forward without having that support around you and being patient for it to sort of come out. So a lot of my book, Burn the Boats, and a lot of my life has been about, including dropping out of high school, making these bold moves or bold bets with not a lot of evidence to support it. My hope is that my book becomes your companion manual when you find yourself with one of those opportunities and no one's given you the time of day. No, it's exciting. Even that, um, another one of your brands, Bonza, I, I, uh, th that's big now. All of a sudden. Yeah, Bonds is big. Yeah, we uh, yeah, and then some of these are smaller stakes. Bonds, we had a tiny stake, but a great company, and we're very early. Yeah, I just tend to be at the intersection of these emerging trends and have enough pattern recognition skills to figure out whether the CEO has the ability to bring it. Because as you know, it's one thing to have an idea, but to be able to bring it to market is a whole nother. Endless things can go wrong along the way, and usually do. So a lot of what I spend my time doing is creating a culture of self awareness within me and around me. So we can get to the heart of the matter. Do you have what it takes to go the distance? Folks, we're with Burn the Boats author Matt Higgins of RSD Ventures. We're talking about all things business, Burn the Boats, little uh, bio. This is great. So um, we have a bunch of talking points and things that I haven't gone over because I've been so enamored by the by the conversation. Yeah, let's throw those out. We don't need to so, stick to anything. Um, <laughs> no, but this is good. Uh, I, I, well, I really enjoyed a lot of similarities here. So you mentioned canaries in the coal mine, warning signs. Can you elaborate on that? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's, uh, it's already happening so quickly, so this even can seem a little dated because it's now, I think, more obvious. When I was – I, was, I started going on TV and sounding the alarm a couple of months ago because I feel like uh, Wall Street and the White House are not leveling with the American public, that the signs are everywhere, that we are laboring under a mountain of credit, and it's going to come crashing down on us. Now it's already started, right, but back then. And the canaries in the coal mine were the following. Americans have $1 trillion of credit card debt, more than we've had in any time, record debt, Two. The number of people, because of high interest rates and and uh, inflation, that are falling behind, 60 days behind on their car payments, is now greater than it was at the peak of the Great Recession crisis in 2008, uh, up 30% year over year, right? The, uh, the savings rate of Americans has plummeted from 9% to 3%. So there are all these like warnings that the American consumer is already struggling, and the only thing that's propping up our economy is consumer spending. Where's that money coming from? It's coming from pandemic savings because we went wild with trillions of dollars of money with not a lot to show for it. So it turns out free money isn't free. And it's coming from consumers making ends meet and paying for their eggs that are 70% more expensive using credit, right? So, so the, 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 the challenge is all it takes is one change for it all to begin to unravel, and that's the unemployment rate. Now, the Fed has told us all that they plan to fire 1.5 million Americans. What do I mean by that? In order to get inflation to go from 6% to 2%, approximately uh, 1.5 million people are going to lose their job as a result of unemployment rate going up because that is the only way to bring inflation down. The wage pressure is the thing that's holding up and propping up inflation. So 
I feel frustrated watching, wait, why are economists at banks telling Americans we're going to have a soft landing? What's soft about a million and a half people losing their job? Why is the White House putting out statements saying, Eureka, unemployment is so low? It's like, it's, I get po why politically it's palatable to say that, but it's not being honest. Whereas what we should be saying to America is, is put your credit card away, batten down the hatches, preserve cash. Things are going to get rough, rough because we printed money. And there needs to be a great reckoning on the heels of the Great Recession, right? That's what we had in 08. This time it's the Great Reckoning. And it's going to be okay, but you got to be prudent with your spending. And so, but now fast forward three months, that seems kind of quaint because it's obvious now, right? I mean, with the what's happening with the banks and 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 everything that's going on. I, I do think that what the government did was probably necessary at a moment in time, but now we have a new form of moral hazard, which you and I can uh, can break out, break down, break down. Yeah, what do you think about the, the nationalization of the banks? I, I know, uh, were you a guest on Shark Tank? I was a guest on Shark Tank, yeah, two seasons. I get into that in the, bank, in the book, too. We were like, wait, Shark Tank? Yeah, I did the <laughs> two seasons on Shark Tank. Again, you know, the genesis, and we can go back to the uh, to the apocalypse in a second, but the genesis of that was just, uh, you know, we, my son and I always bonded over that show. I always admired it. Frankly, it's a great way to also establish your profile as a great investor. So there are personal reasons, too. Oh, yeah. And I just decided. I said, you know what? I don't know what it takes to be on Shark Tank. That doesn't seem to be an application on the Internet nor nor, nor a template. But I'm going to get on Shark Tank. And I spent a year uh, in conversations with them. And then they gave me my shot. And they thought I did great. And they brought me back. That's great. So Kevin O'Leary was talking about the nationalization of the banks. He got some press for that. So what's up with yeah. the banks? What do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I love Kevin O'Leary. He always managed to say something bombastic that, that gets traction. Uh, kudos to him. You know, uh, look, on the, on, the, on the one hand, uh, if they didn't step in and prop up Silicon Valley Bank's deposit holders, uh, the, the contagion and the knock-on effects would have been extraordinary. So uh, I'm not going to backtrack from the fact that I supported what the government did in the instance, right? But the challenge is, is that Silicon Valley Bank's behavior – mirrored the excesses of the industry that it was supporting, right? It was a growth at all costs. <clears throat> the idea that you have 97% of your deposit holders uh, are not insured. The whole purpose of FDIC insurance is to calm people so that you can make sure there isn't a run on bank, right? There are enough people and there's enough deposits on hand to stabilize the situation. So both the FDIC was aware of this exact scenario because they talked about it on February 28th, but they didn't do anything about it. And the risk managers at Silicon Valley Bank should have been aware of this exact scenario because it doesn't take much for a few of your high net worth individual deposit holders. The problem with the scenario is there were mom and pop innocent deposit holders who put their money on, in a bank on a Friday and expected it to be there on a Monday. What do you do about that, right? You're talking about an Etsy, all of Etsy's you know, payroll like with that bank. So what do you do about it? The challenge now is that now you've telegraphed to every bank in the United States that don't worry, you can now market to your deposit holders, your customers, that your money's safe. It won't take long for moral hazard to bleed into the system and people to start making reckless decisions again. So what I haven't seen from the U.S. banking system and the regulators, and maybe I'm missing it, is where, where are the new regulations that are going to ensure that banks are forced to, to keep the right ratio of deposit holders, insurance versus uninsured, or else – you know, contagion of moral hazard will bleed onto the system everywhere. So, and then secondly, the way that the stock market has reacted to a bunch of other banks, uh, First Republic, but, you know, now a ton of others, they're going, they're pouring through everyone's debt structure to figure out, you know, who's in trouble. And so clearly it wasn't enough what they've done to, to, to stem the contagion in, in, in that sense. But I'm less worried about whether banks go under, frankly, and more worried about how do we extract and pull back and mitigate moral hazard that's now sneaked into our banking system. What about, you know, that's a good point. I'm worried about Silicon Valley too and private equity. I mean, that's your industry a little bit, but I, I just did a quick Google of, you know, unicorn companies in 2023. It was something like $18 trillion of wealth is just in Silicon Valley type unicorn companies. That to me is the 08 crisis times. Like, I don't think we realize, and maybe, maybe you haven't thought about this, but I wanted your take, because you're in private equity. In, in, a, in a way, I'm worried about that. I, I, 
is any am I alone? No, no, no. You are. I mean, uh, if you if we below the surface, like so, even though we saved Silicon Valley Bank deposit holders, what we didn't save is the DNA or paradigm of that particular bank and what that particular bank did was an enabler. It was an enabler of endlessly high valuations that you know couldn't necessarily have been supported ultimately. It wrote debt at the top of you know the cap table where they would they would loan against you know the equity, the illiquid equity, which is unusual. It's not like JP Morgan was necessarily doing that. So what went out the window is this sort of propping up the ecosystem with venture debt that is not gonna be replaced elsewhere or supplied elsewhere. But I look at that, what are the consequences of that? Sooner or later, many, many, many of these companies that were funded based upon growth and not profitability, uh, we're going to be unable to raise successive rounds and we're gonna be unable to get more funding and we're gonna go under, right? That was going to happen. Now that's going to happen sooner and faster. Is that the worst thing in the world? Honestly, not really, because it just means we need the reckoning to happen anyway. And so the companies that are gonna go under are the ones who are gonna be unable to convince or unwilling to convince in the time frame uh, that somebody should put money into those companies at much lower valuations. You know, a lot of CEOs create prisons of their own making with these inflated valuations, and then they won't take the medicine in time, and then it's too late, it's a scramble. And so the reality is lots of different companies in tech and startup land are gonna need to raise money and equity faster, and only the best will be able to survive. So there will be a series of companies going under, going bankrupt, or being you know gobbled up, and there'll be lawyer, law, uh, layoffs that will follow. I just don't think that's a result of what just happened. It's just gonna happen a lot faster. There's 1,207 unicorns. How many will go under? There was, there was. Right? There was I mean, yeah. there was, yeah. There was. I don't, how many of those you know, will go under? Ninety percent, eighty percent. I don't know if they'll necessarily. All those will go under. The equity will be crammed down, so early investors, you know, will 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 be diluted to oblivion. Uh, but the best will survive. That's why when somebody said, if uh, there was a lot of arguments, if, if Silicon Valley Bank were to go under, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the 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 we're going to lose decades of innovation to China. Like that's just ear mongering because. You know, capitalists and, vent and private equity are fundamentally mercenary and opportunistic. They would have went ahead and taken advantage of the situation and gobbled up the best and let the let the worst kind of go. So I don't know what percentage will survive. I just know that the best will survive by doing accepting money on more egregious terms, and the worst will be gobbled up or, or will collapse. And I think that's you know that's part of you know creative destruction and capitalism. Right. That, it's that, it's that, a good thing. That, that does Right, that's our system. If we don't, if that's not part of our system anymore, then we're not, we're not capitalism, right? So it, it, there is a, a degree of Darwinism happening within our, our government, and that's okay. The reverse is worse, right? That things are propped up with free money. You know, that's just an illusion, right? And a house of cards. But here's what I'm worried about. Founder X has $100 million at Silicon Valley Bank because he needed it there to get the loans and all this other stuff. Yep. Why should that guy be bailed out? Like, I don't. Uh, so that's a challenge. It's very hard to cherry pick who should be bailed out and who wasn't, right? So he shouldn't be bailed out. But why should uh, somebody working at a company that is a direct-to-consumer business operating in, you know, in, in Ohio, you know, and did nothing wrong, and they don't get paid this week because their, pay their company's payroll was with Silicon Valley Bank? So the challenge was was cherry picking who gets hurt. But they could have was, done it in. They could have said payroll is is backed, depositors backed up to ten million. That way, that hundred million dollar yeah. guy, he could have got ten I, I million. Agree. I, I agree. If they, if they had more, more I agree they could have had a much more. Right, they agree they could have had a much more surgical solution if it wasn't for the fact that they were on the clock. Right, so they had to, the other enemy was contagion and the collapse of the entire banking system. But let me let me put it back to you. Was that the wrong deduction? It really, if we look, even with the federal government signaling, we're gonna backstop deposits and now we have unlimited FDIC insurance, you still have First Republic, you know, teetering or, or being, a, you know, whatever, under assault uh, on the equity markets, Credit Suisse, on and on, regional banks facing pressure. So even with that uh, medicine, it didn't work. Imagine had they not stepped in. I mean, it would have been unbelievable stock market crash. Unlike it would have been 1929-ish. On I, I really yeah, no, no, so no I was feeling that. By the way, I was feeling that Friday and Saturday, we were having people call up on the show, 
we did a show and we had people talking about they were going to Boston Private Credit, which was taken over by Silicon Valley Bank, and there were lines out the door. It, it was scary. It was a scary weekend, for sure. Right. So how, how do you? So how do you? How do you fall? Okay. You know, uh, depositors up to five million are insured. I think, you know, that would have still done no, something. I, you know, five, you, ten million, yeah. and we're right. gonna make I, sure payroll's I, covered or something. I, Right, and I guarantee that in the we- in the meetings that took place over that weekend, there was a whiteboard in some office where they're like, okay, is it possible that we could protect just the payroll? What if we send it to $5 million? Yeah, but the problem is we got these companies where they've got $50 million, you know, it, it, like on and on. I, I agree with you. I think that was half the problem, but the reason why they probably went with the solution they went with and to Telegraph is because they thought the entire uh, financial system would become dominoes, and it's because they had insight into other fact patterns that were not completely dissimilar. So maybe, uh, you know, Silicon Valley Bank had 97% of deposit holders, but there's this other bank with 70. And, you know, and you, one could say, well, the, tre- the Fed caused it because they are the ones who devalued, you know, two-year treasuries. I actually don't buy into that. I think this has been a failure of regulation and of risk management at those institutions. So, but, but here's the thing. There's more of the, so this billion-dollar, uh, these unicorns become, I don't know, you know, one tenth of corns. So they're worth a hundred million instead of a billion, all all across the industry. How many other banks have that risk right now? I mean, there's there's eighteen trillion of something of wealth. Like it can't, they just can't keep bailing out every bank. Yeah, but I, I do. Well, if we look at the fact pattern that sank. Silicon Valley Bank, there's different issues at work here, right? It's the percentage of the, uh, it's basically the ratio of percent of, a, of uninsured deposits to these treasuries that they were holding that were not marked to market, right? I mean, those things were, the only reason why this started is when they went to have to sell that, right? And they ended up selling uh, basically at a $1.8 billion loss, $21 billion of their portfolio at a $1.8 billion loss. Everybody woke up and said, wait a second, we run the math. That means that, you know, your books, don't really match your exposure if only people were to start pulling money out and you had to maintain your ratio, right? So that is the scenario. There are less, there are different degrees of that. Um, the issue of unicorns suddenly being worth one tenth, I don't believe has the same contagion or consequence for the banking industry. I think that's a different consequence. It's layoffs, people out of a job. You know, it's uh, other starters being unable, unable to raise money. But like I said earlier, I think that was going to happen anyway, and probably needs to happen. So let's go back to the book, Burn the Boats. What haven't I asked you that you want to share from Burn the Boats? Although I, what I'm, makes me want to read your book more, are, are, we, are we getting books shipped to us? I want, I want your book. I, I don't know. Let's so, go. So, yeah, let's because get because I mean, I, operators, are, operators are standing operators by. Are standing <laughs> by. Call me at 888-988-JOSH for a free review. I'll buy Matt Higgins' book to everyone who wants it. Because I love this guy. I never, you know, now that I think of it, I remember oh, you, you on Shark Tank, uh, you know, on the CNBC rerun. Now that you're, you know, occasionally I would have it on. I'm like, who's that guy? He's a new guy. He's a new shark. What happened yeah. to Kevin Harrington, right? Like, yeah, no, you know, that, you feel no, bad no, for I'm Kevin Harrington because he was, he was on. And as Shark Tank was blowing up, they like. Where, where'd Kevin Harrington go? You know, such a good point. He was there right in the beginning. I think he sold the coins, right? Like uh, this is the the New York Mint, the U.S. Mint, right? Remember those coins on on, on those infomercials? I think that was him. Uh, so something I'd love to talk. Thank you, by the way, for the support. This book is my life's work, and 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 it was born of this idea that uh, that you know the self possessed or the people you and I, Josh, we grew up in somewhat degree of dysfunction, right? So we had to architect our own support system ourselves. We have to prop ourselves up with a force of will, right? And whatever God gave us. And not everybody has that. I wrote my book for the risk adverse or the anxiety ridden or the angst laden, you know, and the people who really don't have that sort of support system internally or externally to one telegraph. I'm a person who came from dirt and I could do it. You can do it too. But by the way, even though I've achieved all this success, I still struggle with those legacy issues. The little boat on the cover of my book is meant to be a paper boat in a bathtub of a kid because a lot of the things that hold us back are these legacy issues from childhood. They undermine our confidence, our security. So the use of the word boat is a metaphor. 
for all the things in your life that are preventing you from, from fully committing. And I, I offer myself up as a case study, but I go into 50 different athletes, celebrities, you know, my partner, Scarlett Johansson, NFL coaches, all to show that everybody's got something. We all can't be like Kevin O'Leary where we just don't give a, you know, the rest of us do. I do. I've dealt with imposter syndrome on the set of Shark Tank. I have dealt with testicular cancer and losing one testicle and all the issues that go with that divorce. I talk about all of my books to telegraph to everybody out there. Just because you're risk adverse or maybe life hasn't worked out the way you thought it would be does not mean that you do not deserve to fully pursue your grand ambition, your, your plan A. It's that just nobody's taught you how to, one, relate to risk and how to process risk, and number two, how to handle failure when you and bounce back. I believe my book does that. So I'm so, so passionate about it. I worked on it for years during the, during the pandemic and you know for the last year, three years in the making, but 48 years in the living, all to sort of hopefully so somebody out there listening is like, damn, all right, I can do it. You're not some random white guy on Shark Tank. You're a guy who ate government cheese when you were 16 and you figured it out. Yeah, it, it um, you know, we could title this show Two Guys on Welfare Who Made Something of Themselves. And people don't think that. I mean, I had somebody on my Instagram. I'm, I'm not really a social media guy. I, I run a fiduciary firm and we help, you know, high net worth clients. But I just started, you know, running daily Instagram things. And somebody goes, I feel like this is somewhat undermining of more systemic ways that people get rich. Like, so I was just posting on ways, things that I would teach my kids on, on sort of like attributes to become wealthy. And one of my tips was like, who you marry? Like, because so By much way, so important. of your future destiny is who you marry. It, it, like, and the heartbreaks and the losses and working with people of high net worth, the divorce or the marriage is so central to their sense of self, the baggage on the little boy with the, you know, the toy boat. There's so many connections there. And this person says something like, while social mobility is possible, it is relatively low, with only about 6% of people born into the bottom fifth of the income distribution, that's us, right? Who can yeah. who can be upwardly mobile? And I was trying to say, well, that's why I'm trying to do these. You know, I don't need to go on Instagram and you know pay my social media people. Um, I was doing it to kind of reach the masses and to kind of share my story. And that's what I love about your book, Burn the Boat. So everybody should get it. I'm going to become a salesman for Burn the Boats. I love this. I love it. Oh, thank you great. so much. And to chime in on that last point just for a second, I have, uh, you know, I've gone through a lot, but I was blessed to make a really great decision. You know, I married my wife, Sarah, and I was talking just about, I was talking to her about this earlier, the importance of basically making your, your partner, your spouse, your co-founder, and viewing them as such with the respect and all that goes into it, because then your relationship is always one of mutual choice. You never take each other for granted and that you have a choice to either marry an energy vampire or a false multiplier. We tend to think we're looking for people to complete us in some fairy tale. It's not what we're looking for. We're looking for someone to amplify us, what makes us great and do the same for them. And my wife, my partner is the unlock that has enabled me to be on Shark Tank, write this book, build this portfolio because that is the nature. So I, I love that you talk about that openly because we don't. We like bypass that, and that is either going to be a massive derailer of your life or a massive unlock in your life. Yeah, and it was interesting that this person was was negative about – they were being polite. They were just trying to say, oh, these are systemic issues. Well, I don't know how I had some mobility then, but it's probably a lot of the similar burn-the-boats type uh, philosophies that you talk about in your book. Because a lot of it is um, – I was talking to Tony Robbins one time. I got to interview him for Worth Magazine. He came on. I said, what is the number one attribute when you've managed, like, successful people, people who have kind of been upwardly mobile? And he said it was hunger. And, and hunger and grit. And he said the hardest thing as a father, once you've kind of arrived, is how do you teach hunger in your kids? And I, I did that, like, six, seven years ago. And it got me thinking because I have, like, seven kids. 14 and under, and it's very tough. How am I going to put my kids in situations where they become hungry, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's funny you said that because sometimes people who come from where you and I came from, they try to, like, prosthetically install and manufacture fake crisis. You know, it's hard to do when you have resources. So I've come 
to the point I've tried to remove the negative and make sure nothing about me telegraphs that I derive self-esteem from my assets, my worth, my things, like that they, they are irrelevant. And so hopefully the kids see model that what I value is impact. And, and fortunately, I'm blessed that my kids are intrinsically motivated. Uh, and then uh, thank God, you know, but it, but, but, but it definitely is a challenge. Back to your upward mobility issue, I do acknowledge in my book, look, I grew up as a white kid, right? I'll never understand what the sort of inherent advantage of being both white and male, but there definitely was, right? If I, I'm a kid, you know, seems intelligent, articulate, and I have a GD, it's aberrational. You're like wondering, like, what happened to you, Matt? And if you're a kid growing up in my neighborhood and you're a minority, it was confirmatory, right? That's a powerful thought. And so I talk in my book about how when I taught at Harvard, um, I had this amazing conversation at the end of the class with a, a black woman in my class. And we had a, a speaker come in and they were, you know, kind of cursing and whatever. And she said to me, I could never talk like that in this class. And I said, well, why? She has two reasons. One, everybody would think, you know, there she goes, right? I was like, wow. And she goes, but more importantly, I carry the weight of every black woman who walks into Harvard Business School. I carry the, the heaviness. Of, I'm a representative of future black women who come into this institution. And if I don't behave a certain way, I'm ruining it for them. And that really crystallized for me. That is the inherent advantage. I do not represent anybody. I had the, the, the blessing that I represented me, this scrappy kid, and other people don't have that. And that is undeniable. And I put that in my book, not to lecture, not to preach, not to virtue signal, to illustrate through that one story. And so hopefully people have a bit of compassion because nobody likes to feel like the work they did was devalued or minimized. Like, cause you and I both know how hard it is to do what we did, but it doesn't, it's not either or. You can acknowledge that somebody else has maybe more of a burden than you do, but still say, okay, but now what, right? Like, what are we gonna do? And, it's, and, it, and to your point, it's that hunger. It's capturing that fire. But also more importantly, I wrote my book like a novel and not like a, a reference book, because that's not how people learn. They learn through stories. I wanted people to finish my book and maybe in one sitting and leave be, and feel like infinite possibility. Like, okay, it is possible. I see me and you, I can meet you somewhere in this journey or one of these stories. And now I feel like I can do it. No, oh, fantastic. I think a lot of even what you said, I would say if there is a um, privilege of my upbringing, it was that I had a mom and dad that both loved me and that were around, even though we were on welfare. And that to me, like having parents, two parents together, even though we were destitute, you know, it was a nice, it was a beautiful thing and their faith. And like you were saying, your kids are intrinsically motivated. I think a lot of that, because of talking to people, I think it's a, it's a faith thing. It's, it's a spirituality issue. Sometimes it's a humility, grace. Um, yeah. It's wonderful. Modeling. It's modeling. They yeah. see things, you know, they, they, live, they look at you and they emulate you. They don't listen to you, right? They, they look at you and they watch. Wonderful. Well, this was great. Matt Higgins, burn the boats, get the book uh, wherever books are sold. Where, 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 where do you do you have a website? Well, anybody, for anybody listening right now on uh, Twitter, you can hit my bio and it's there. It's on Twitter Spaces. Uh, I'm on Amazon. is a you know great way. Thank you so much. And if you've read it, thank you for the note. I'm getting notes from all over the world about people burning their boats. So I love hearing how you burned your boats. I'm I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. You could find me there and on Twitter as well. Yeah, and there's um great great song "Burn the Ships" that kind of you gotta you, you know that song from. For King and Country, it would go great with your book. Have you heard that? I would uh, no, but I would love you to sing it for everybody playing along it, at home. You haven't heard this song? No, I mean, I, no. Now I have to appropriate oh, it. Number one, you got to do this. Okay, take your family to go see For King and Country. You can come with us. We'll okay. go together, in New York or wherever where we are. It's a great show. Good family-friendly show. Great concert. And they have a, a song called Burn the Ships. It's amazing. And they go, like, they're, they're all the pyrotechnics. Really? And, I love that. And they have a music video. Helped. And you should you should uh, approach them about kind of some joint venture. They have I joint ventures. Used, I just wish they had used Burn the Boats instead of Burn well, the Ships. Right. Well, you know, it's – yeah. <laughs> it may kind of be – a but, hey, you know, they could put your book, Burn the Boats, Burn the Ships, same concept. And they have a great music video, and it kind of goes perfectly with what you're saying. So awesome! I will yeah, check look it, it up. Burn okay. the ships, bo burn the boat, buy the book, burn the boats. 
but get the uh, download the song "Burn the Ships" too. By for King and Country, excellent. You can call me, folks, eight at eight nine at eight. Josh, I will buy "Burn the Bo- Boats" for you if you schedule and keep your no obligation review with our team. Eight at eight nine at eight. Josh, or go to Amazon, buy the book. Uh, I'm going to run over buy the book right now uh, because I've just learned so much from you. It was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, and have an amazing night. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe out there. Take care. Bye now. Thank you, Twitter Spaces. Follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and uh, go get the book. So I ended this.